Provident Healthcare Partners is a healthcare investment bank that is focused on transaction advisory services. We created this podcast for healthcare executives, entrepreneurs, shareholders, and providers who are interested in learning more about the world of healthcare consolidation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining another episode of Providence Dealcast. This is Steve Grasa speaking. I'm a vice president at the firm. Today, we're going to be talking everything related to payer dynamics within the autism space and really try and tease out the best ways to build a payer relationship platform, which has become increasingly important in today's environment. I have a few special guests today to opine on the topic, which is obviously a very pertinent one. The first is Rick Lowenstein. Rick has 20 years of C-suite experience within healthcare and is the acting CEO and founder of Team Game Advisors, which helps ABA and behavioral health providers grow and navigate the increasingly challenging business waters of ABA. I'm also joined by my colleague, Tommy Spiegel, who's a vice president at Provident and helps to lead up our efforts within the autism services space. So we're excited to delve in here. And with that, let's get right into it with some quick introductions. Tommy, did you want to start? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Hello, everyone. My name is Tommy Spiegel, and I am vice president here at Provident Healthcare Partners. I work alongside Steve and cover the APA and autism space and am based out of our Boston office. I started my career at PNC Bank, Pittsburgh, then did some consulting work outside of New York City, and then have been working in the healthcare investment banking space ever since, so for the past six years or so. I just want to make one point here that over the years, myself, Steve, and the rest of the Providence team have really enjoyed working with our clients and other owners and operators in the ABA space, not only connecting with them on clinical level, but also working together and leading them through the transaction process. You know, our goal here at Provident has always been to maximize value value of our clients, but also ensure a cultural and philosophical alignment with their future partner. It's great to have the team together on this and excited to dig in. I will pass it off to our uh, special guest here and resident expert in the payer relations space, introduce himself and firm, uh, Rick Lowenstein. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Tommy. And thanks, Steve, for having me. I really do appreciate it. My name is Rick Lowenstein. I have been in the disability space for almost 20 years. I've been in the ABA-related space a dozen of those years. I was the Chief Strategy and Growth Officer for Centria Healthcare, a national ABA provider. Prior to that, I was the CEO of a nonprofit organization that worked with people with developmental disabilities in housing and supported living in the community. And for the past four and a half years, along with my wife of almost 42 years and business partner, we founded Team Game Advisors. And over the course of our time, we've been working with PE-backed, VC-backed, privately held behavioral health and autism therapy providers grow and scale their businesses. And when we think of growth, we always think of really two pillars of that. It's internal growth, meaning being prepared internally with people, systems, and operations to grow responsibly and strategically and externally creating demand, understanding the marketplace, and understanding the dynamics outside of the organization that will have a major impact on the growth of the organization. And I'm just thrilled to be here to talk about something that I love, I'm passionate about, and that is providing services to people that need assistance. Great. Thanks for that introduction, Rick. Why don't we get right into it then? Why are payer relations important and why is this particularly relevant right now? I'll start. I mean, there's no doubt about there's been a proliferation of, you know, ABA providers across the country and an associated influx of investment dollars. But I think, unfortunately, what we've seen when talking to groups that there has been a little bit more of a variability in terms of quality. You know, there's 100 plus autism providers who currently or previously had PE backing. And historically, if you're an ABA practice that showed you know, simply the ability to open up new locations, that in and of itself was viewed favorably by the investment community. But in some situations, that has resulted in a decrease in quality. And, you know, this is obviously a people and kiddo first industry. So growing too quickly can sometimes make the business difficult to manage. So 
over the years and where Rick is really an expertise is we've seen a refocus a little bit on operations to ensure clinical quality remains high. And part of that work stream is to ensure collaborative dynamic with payers, because at the end of the day, having a strong payer relations is really a way to differentiate yourself. And it's not as simple as being able to negotiate higher rates. Like, obviously that's important from a profitability perspective, but building a dynamic relationship goes much deeper, which is why we have the expert here to help us walk through what you know you can do to build that relationship and what he's seeing play out in this space. So that's a good tee up, I think, to not just building a payer relations strategy, but unpacking some of what you said, Tommy, I think is important. Let's walk back to the early 2010, 11, 12, 13, when legislation started changing in states, this legislation mandate required that insurance companies and Medicaid pay for ABA services. ABA is an evidence-based therapy and only one approved by the American Academy of Pediatrics. CDC and Surgeon General is having the most profound impact on children with autism and their families. So as you said, Tommy, there was in some ways a new industry created. And as a result, there was opportunity to grow. Many states didn't even have many BCBAs, board certified behavior analysts within those states to actually write treatment plans for kids with autism. So it started out as a almost like a new field. And there were providers that decided, hey, we're just going to go into as many states as we possibly can. We want to get contracts and just be in those states. Through COVID, providers realized business as usual was not going to cut it. And in some cases, the reimbursement rates were much lower than what they were paying out to perform those services. And so this whole idea of changing the dynamic came into light. So at Team Game Advisors, we look at a relationship with a payer as being relational and taking it away from a transaction only relationship. And what I mean by that is a provider provides ABA services to a client. They then submit a claim for that service, and then they get paid by the provider. There's no human interaction other than obviously the point of service where treatment is being done, but there's no relationship with the payer at that point. It's transactional. The provider does their work. They send in a bill to be paid, and the payer pays that bill. When we think of a relationship with a payer, we think of it as being relationship driven. There's humans behind, we're in a human field and we're dealing with humans. So why shouldn't we know who is behind the payer curtain, if you will, and begin to build and develop relationships with them, both on a clinical level and on a strategic and growth level. And we can talk a little bit more about that as we go, but that's the stage I think that's being set for how and why you would wanna build a relationships with your payers. Yeah, why don't we go right there then? How, how do you then turn that dynamic from transactional to relational? Well, I can tell you that it's not an overnight flick the switch and just make it happen. I wish it were, and many, providers don't invest the time in order to develop that relationship. It takes time and in many cases, patience and persistence. And at Team Game Advisors, that's what we've been able to do successfully for a number of providers, establishing the relationship to an ongoing basis. So the hardest part is starting, <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you to find who is that human inside of the payer organization that you can have a conversation with. Sometimes it's a provider relations person, it may be contracting and credentialing, but once you've established these relationships, you then open the door for a variety of, not just opportunities, but a variety of ways to problem solve within an organization. Let me give you an example. You're contracted with a payer, and it's taking an exceedingly long time to have one of the providers get credentialed within the organization. If you have a contact person within the payer community or within that payer, you should be able to find out where you are in the process, 
what the holdup is, how long is it going to take? And nine times out of 10, you'll have that problem resolved in a short period of time. If you don't have that relationship, you're sitting on the outside wondering, why is it taking three months, four months, five months to have this provider or one of our clinicians get credentialed? That's just one example. There's a number of examples. Accounts receivable. If you have a contact at the payer on the payable side, you should be able to problem solve that in a short period of time if your receivables are exceedingly long. Those are just two small examples of, of how to do that. And it begins with a conversation and trying to find one contact will lead to other contacts within a particular payer organization. Yeah, Rick, no, absolutely agree. I mean, at the end of the day, the economics here make a big difference. So, you know, a lot of groups historically have managed these relationships and specifically rate negotiation in house. Some are successful to varying degrees, but some just are not at the end of the day. Groups we've worked with and groups we've spoken to, you know, have quoted success in the two to five percent increase range, which is great. Definitely helps the business, but you might be leaving some of that increase on the table and it might help to bring an expert. So obviously rate increases are helpful for several reasons, you know, some of which might be obvious. It's at the end of the day, critical to keep the business running effectively. The difference between a 3% and a 10% increase directly translates into being able to keep up with rising labor costs and paying your provider. So obviously compensation isn't the only factor impacting a business when it comes to recruitment and retention and profitability. But if you have RBTs leaving for dollar an hour at a big box retailer or, or a local competitor, you know, this can ease the pain a bit. And, you know, building relations with payers also impacts new contract negotiations, ensuring that those contracts fit you know, the company's needs and keep expanding access to care to meet what seems like a constantly increasing demand state. Great. Thanks, Tommy. Rick, from a relationship standpoint, how do reimbursement rates come into the equation then? We see reimbursement rates as part of the overall relationship building with a payer. and. While, as Tommy mentioned, some providers will call up their payer and say, hey, I've had the same rate for two years. The inflation rate has increased 15% over the last two years. I want a rate increase. Nine times out of 10, the payer is going to say, okay, uh, here, you and everybody else wants it, but tell me why. And so what we do at Team Game Advisors is work with providers to, in many ways, build a case for support. And that includes sharing pertinent information about the company, about the provider, who they are, why they got into business, what service areas they're servicing, what services they provide. Do they provide just ABA? Do they provide speech, OT? Do they have a licensed clinical social worker on staff? Do they do diagnostic testing? So. There's an opportunity once you have established a contact point, there's an opportunity to share information about the organization and why you're better than everybody else. Do you have a BHCOE accreditation? Are you accredited with any other provider organizations that are worthy of note, that have standards of quality? The other is it's an, also an opportunity to share clinical data with them. Okay, so in terms of utilization, are you utilizing the hours, you being the provider? Is the provider utilizing the hours given by the payer? Are they providing the appropriate supervision on serving the families? Are they doing enough parent training? So this begins the flow of back and forth information to build a case for support that says provider X is accredited, has high clinical quality, high parent satisfaction, high RBT retention, anything else you want to throw in there. And as a result, our clinical quality is outstanding and our rates should go from A to A plus, fill in the blank. That's the case for support. And that is, as I said at the beginning, one pillar, one pillar of the relationship with a payer. 
you touched on a few data points, but what other KPIs are payers looking for to analyze quality of a provider? Yeah, as I said, I think most of the time they are looking for authorization utilization. They're looking for supervision. They're looking for parent training. And some payers are looking for clinical outcomes, meaning uh, baseline Vineland, how many skills were required over the course of the treatment. They look at graduation rates. A payer really doesn't want to have a child in their quote unquote system forever. And I think the goal of providers should be to the benefit of the child and the family to graduate them out of services and into the community. So those are just a few of the, the KPIs, if you will, that we like to share with payers on behalf of our clients who are the providers. When you have a relationship with a payer, it's also an opportunity for you to say to them, what would you like to see? What would you like us to provide you in order to build this relationship together? And so those are some of the ways that using this relationship helps everybody. Great. That's really helpful. Appreciate the insight. Let's think this through the lens of selling your business then. Tommy, how does this translate to the preparation work that we're doing prior to approaching the market? Yeah, thanks, Steve. So when we are getting groups ready to go to market, we're ultimately going to do a deep dive into contracts, rates, and relationships. So we'll look at what payer contracts exist today. When are they going to be potentially renegotiated? If the group is looking to renegotiate a contract, we'll discuss with them in detail their strategy, the timing, and how to succeed in those situations. There's definitely ways to approach this and to not approach this, as Rick has mentioned. We'll also look at contracts from a growth perspective, and that could be getting new contracts in an existing market to tap into a new rate or a kiddo population, or even expanding to a new market for similar reasons. You know, understanding a provider's pair and contract dynamic is critical to pre-market preparation because these contracts are going to be a key diligence checkpoint through the process. If you're a business looking to sell, contracts can make a major difference. And if we all put our buyer's hat on for a minute here and, and we think about what is an investor or a strategic actually buying when they acquire a business, you could make an argument that it's the client. But fortunately or unfortunately, however you look at it, you know, the demand for clients appears to be endless across the country. You can make a case for acquiring the staff, but we have seen situations where integration plans like work out really well and then also not so great where, you know, a decent amount of the staff leaves. I do think the tide is changing there a little bit because in a lot of transactions we've worked on, owners are expected to stay on rather than sunset so they can better manage you know, the culture and the messaging of the business post-close, but still there's a risk involved with the staff. Lastly is, is the contract, which I and most would argue is one of the most important value drivers in running a business and creating value for a business. So you know, when buyers look at groups, they're gonna look at the rates, right? The 97155s, the 97153s, they're going to look to see if there are any unique programs, like there could be unique government-run programs like the regional centers in California, other unique programs like Easter Seals, and, and really they're going to place a higher value on groups with a differentiated contract. But when it comes to EBITDA adjustments and like earnings and what we're going to do on the financial front prior to going to market, so we've ultimately seen a normalization across pro forma adjustments and what buyers are going to accept. The days of clinic maturity adjustment are somewhat or basically over. But if you do renegotiate a new payer rate increase, we have success getting credit for that. Some buyers may argue that there is a wage increase to offset the revenue increase, but that benefit is still net positive. And then the last thing I want to mention here, this gets into like transaction structure a little bit, but transactions can ultimately structure a stock or asset sale. If structured as an asset sale, that's going to require more consent and notifications to the payers regarding the contract. For stock sales, that's not the case because the entity's tax ID remains post-close. So because of this, in the pre-marketing phase, we're going to do an in-depth review to see what is slash is not required 
from the co contract so we can minimize hurdles later in the process and once in diligence. Thank you both. It looks like we're coming up on time. Rick, Tommy, do you have any closing comments before we wrap up here? I do. First, I want to thank you guys for having me. I really do appreciate it. The other is the common thread that binds the people that are served, meaning the child and family, the payer, the buyer, the seller, the provider, we're all interlinked with this common thread called clinical quality. And when an organization, when a provider is providing outstanding clinical quality, the rest takes care of itself. By that, I mean, when your BCBAs and your RBTs are following the treatment plan and there's high clinical fidelity and you begin to see some really significant outcomes in the child. The child's happy, the parents are happy, your RBTs and your BCBAs are happy because they see the results of their work. They have built a great relationship with the family. As a result, the BCBAs are writing excellent reports. Those are going to the payer. They are on time. The payer then is happy that they're not getting complaints from the parents or the families and that they're turning around their information in a timely manner. And so it makes not just a smooth operating organization, it benefits the child. And at the end of the day, that's why we're here. So clinical quality rules the day, no matter who you are. Well said, Rick. Clinical quality is the common thread that really binds us all together and is probably the single most important provider attribute. So that was really well said. That does it for the podcast. If you like what you heard and looking for more content on the topic and related topics, Rick is actually going to be on a panel at the Autism Investor Summit in April, continuing the conversation on payer dynamics and transitioning from a transactional relationship to a payer relations-based platform. Provident will be in attendance as well. So if you plan on attending, we'll see you there. Thanks again, everyone.